Thank you, Jesus. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning, and if you're a guest today, we are especially glad to have you with us this morning. If this is your first or your second time with us today, we invite you to stop by the back to my right, our hospitality area before you leave. And we have just a small token of appreciation to give you for being here this morning. If you're watching us online this morning, wherever you may be watching from, we welcome you as a part of this service. Pray that it blesses you wherever you may be today. Praise God. I believe that at the conclusion of this message, God is going to do some miraculous things in this place today. I believe, I believe that some of that very well will be physical. But really much more importantly, I believe that what the Holy Ghost is going to do here today is not about your physical man, but about your spiritual man. And so I'm challenging you, and I, it is my hope, it is my faith, that the preaching of the Word this morning will be an inspiration to your faith, so that when the time comes and the invitation is given, whether you're a guest or a faithful member, whichever the case may be, that at that moment you can respond with faith, that God is going to do something for you today. We do not come to church simply to go through the motions of religion. I understand, I realize that probably really the majority of the time most services have a basic format to them. They have a, some th elements to them that we typically do and we typically do them in a similar order. However, we are not locked into a program. We do what we feel to do that may be normal, but with the understanding that at any moment the Holy Ghost can redirect us. So my point is we are not here today just to simply have church as apostolics and say we went to church. We've come to encounter a living God we have come to experience a living God. You have not come today to simply, hopefully you have not come today to simply hear me in the next few moments as a preacher talk about God. My goal is to tell you about Him, but my ultimate goal is for you to experience Him. You know, I, I realize our world is in great turmoil right now. I realize that we as a country are in great turmoil depending upon your personal beliefs, your personal philosophies, you are in great distress right now and others are more hopeful than they've been in a long time. The bottom line to all of it, the bottom line to all of it is, as the old song says, and it really is the truth, Jesus is the answer. For the world today, above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. I, I, I'm, I'm probably every generation prior could say this and it be the truth, but I feel like if we've ever been in a time where the world needs to experience God, it's now. Not to just hear more about religion, not to just be exposed to a religion, but to encounter God. I will say that the best that we can do this morning is provide the atmosphere. If you as an individual do not reach out to Him, you will not get what you need. But I believe the presence of the Lord is in this place. I'm going to say it again. I believe that some folks are going to leave here today changed. Not just encouraged, not just 
touched by the Spirit of God, but changed by the Spirit of God. So Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse number 9, Matthew 9, verse 9. And Jesus passed forth from thence, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, that's the very religious, very religious, when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go you and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Amplified Bible says, I missed the verse I wanted. So the Living Bible says, because people who are well don't need a doctor, it's the sick people who do, was Jesus' reply. Then he added, now go away and learn the meaning of this verse of Scripture. It isn't your sacrifices and gifts I want. I want you to be merciful. I want to preach to you this morning on this subject, the great physician. Not a, but the, the, the great physician. Father, I thank you for your presence that we feel in this place today. I thank you for your spirit that has already been manifested in this service this morning. I pray, God, that you would continue now to minister not only by your spirit, but by your word I pray that you would touch and minister to every individual in this place right now, Lord. I pray, God, that by the end of this service that we dismiss and go our separate ways, there will be people that don't just know about the great physician, but will have come to know and experience you as the great physician. God, I don't want to preach a sermon here this morning and just talk about you and tell good things about you. But I want to deliver a message from you that people can then experience you in this place today. I trust you and I depend on you this morning, Lord. I am trusting you for your anointing today, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Let me, I pulled it up real quick. Let me read to you the Amplified just to give you a little more understanding of what's going on here, the context of what is taking place. In verse 9 of the Amplified, it says this, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew at the tax collector's office. And he said to him, be my disciple, side with my party and follow me. And he arose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at, ta at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and especially wicked sinners came and sat reclined with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your master eat with tax collectors and those 
preeminently sinful. They're not just sinners, but they are at the top of the list of the sinners. But when Jesus heard it, and I, I'm not so sure here that Jesus heard them talking as much as Jesus discerned in his spirit what they were saying. But when Jesus heard it, he replied, Those who are strong and well, healthy, have no need of a physician, but those who are weak and sick. You, you, you have to understand, not only was Matthew a tax collector, a publican, it wasn't that he was just working for the IRS. We may not like the IRS. You may not have fond feelings toward the IRS, but at least the IRS works for our government. At least they are a part of the United States government. What you have to understand about the publicans or these tax collectors is they were... They were collecting taxes for a government that was occupying them. It wasn't their government. They were Jews who were collecting taxes for the Romans. So it wasn't just that they were tax collectors. If you're a tax collector today, I, we won't hold that against you, but... When it comes to your job, we may not really like you. But that's, that's not just what Matthew and then these people who Jesus was fellowshipping with, whose house they were at, it, they, they weren't just IRS employees. They were actually collecting Money from their fellow citizens, from their fellow countrymen, but collecting it for the Romans. And so there was not any fond feelings for these individuals at all. And the interesting thing is, not only did Jesus communicate with Matthew and just interact with him, but he actually invited him to come and be a disciple. Don't just come and sit in the back and hide somewhere and, and be a part. I actually want you to be on my team, if you will. And so he invites Matthew to come with him and, and, and then he is sitting, according to the scripture, at the house of publicans or tax collectors and sinners. And according to the way the the Amplified says it, they were, they were sinners who were preeminently sinners. You know, there's a lot of, not, I'm not talking from a biblical, this isn't biblically correct, okay? So get that. This, the statement I'm about to make is not biblically correct, but from a natural standpoint, it's the way we think. There are good sinners. I don't mean they're good at sinning, that's another category. I mean, they're just good people. They don't break any laws outside of speeding. They, you know, they pay their taxes. They never killed anybody. They don't steal. They don't do that. They, 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 they don't, they're, they're not out partying all hours of the night. They're not involved in illegal activity. They're just, they're just good sinners, good people. Come on, be honest. That's, again, I, that's not the biblical perspective. It's not. But that is human perspective. There are people out there, there's probably a chance there's somebody here today. It's not unlikely that there may be someone here today that you struggle, that you really need to be saved because you're just a really good person. I've met some really, again, naturally speaking, I'll get back to the Bible in a second. I'll let you know when we get there. Right now, we're talking about, you know, from a human perspective. Some really good people. Kind-hearted people. Serving people. People that put others above themselves. And, and, and they're just really good people. So good, they don't really need to be saved. 
Problem is, Jesus kind of took care of that. That's, this is my, you may not like this, this, if I was talking, if I was preaching a different message or if I was talking to you one-on-one, I'd probably say this in a different way and be a lot more sweeter with it. So talk to me after church, I'll give you the other side. But that, that, the big question everybody wants to know, why does bad things happen to good people? There's a simple answer. It's not the one you're going to want to hear. Bad things don't happen to good people. We're getting back to the Bible now. Bad things don't happen to good people because there are no good people. There is none good, said Jesus. But one He was talking about God. Last time I checked, every individual, every human being in this place is not God. So none of us are good. Even the guy holding the microphone right now. So bad things don't happen to good people. I know that doesn't fit the human thing we were talking about a second ago. But you know, we so so from a scriptural standpoint, all... All, all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So everyone needs a Savior. But as I said, from a natural perspective, we, you know, there are preeminent sinners. I mean, there are some that, man, they are, we know, even sinners that are good sinners know they are sinners. Now, I don't really need saving, but that person... Of course, then the problem is this. The people that really, really, that we would say really need saving, we also think they shouldn't be saved. It really is good stuff I have. Hang on. I didn't know we'd make a couple of points along the way. A couple of potholes we'll have to bump over to get there. The people we know that need saving, they just don't deserve to be saved because of what they've done. That's really the context of what was going on here. How are you hanging out with those people? Don't you know who they are and what they are? And and not only are you hanging out with them, but you just invited one of them to be one of your close followers. He responds and simply says, they that are whole. I, I think, I know it's not in the verse and it's not in the Greek. How, how about if you, if you don't know this, if you have a King James Bible and, and, and if you're reading an electronic version, I don't think they do this very well, but if you're reading a printed King James Bible, whenever you see italics, words that are in italics, it is not intended to add emphasis to those words. It is the way of showing you that those words that are in italics were not actually in the original when they translated it. So most of the time they added those words just to make it flow better or sound more proper to English grammar. But sometimes it actually does mess up the meaning a little bit. Now i got to remember why I said all that to you. Hmm. Ah, yes. So put this word, I'm going to add a word, put it in italics. I'm not saying it's there. But I think it may be kind of safe to imply that what he was saying was, those that think they are whole. (laughs) Those that think they are whole don't need or don't realize they need a physician. I've heard of stories, in fact, there's an individual in this church that just last year, I believe it was, went to the doctor for one thing, and while going to the doctor for one thing, the doctor discovered another very serious issue. And fortunately was able to deal with the other very serious issue, even though what the person went to the doctor for wasn't anywhere as significant as that. 
So you may be publicans, or excuse me, you may be Pharisees and think you're religious, but there's a real good chance there's some undiagnosed disease that you've got going on that you just aren't aware of yet. But he kind of just appeals to them and says, those that are whole don't need a doctor. They don't need a physician. So while you may be judging me for where I am and what I'm doing, what I really am doing is just simply hanging out with those that need me. You don't need me and you want to judge others and so that's fine. But I'm going to make myself available to those that have need of me. I'm not going to look at some out outward criteria that causes you to reject them and me reject them as well but I'm going to recognize who has a need and I'm going to go to where the need is I preached to people this morning that you would classify yourself as a publican and as a sinner can I tell you today God's not hanging out with the righteous that have it all together but it's the ones that recognize I am in great need of a savior and that's the ones he's looking to associate with hallelujah listen to what perhaps some of you might be able to relate to as a cry some of these come from the psalmist david in psalm 6 and verse 2 he says have mercy on me O lord for i am weak O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. He wasn't talking literally there. He was expressing something physical. Uh, he was expressing a spiritual or emotional need with physical terms. Psalms 41 in verse 4, he says, I said, again, get, get who's talking here. This is the king of Israel. This is, this is the man who was titled, who was given the, 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 the compliment of being a man after God's own heart. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Jeremiah 17 and 14, the prophet says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Luke chapter 18 and verse 11, the Pharisee, same group of people that are accusing Jesus of what are you doing hanging with the publicans and sinners. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. <laughs> what a prayer. God... I thank you that I am not as other men are. There's a big difference between praying, God, I thank you that I am not as other men, and praying, God, thank you for your grace and mercy in my life that has helped me not to be like. Big difference. I thank you that I am not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as... This publican, he wasn't praying. This guy wasn't praying. He was giving a speech. He was bragging. Because the publican, oh, excuse me, we're not done. I fast twice in the week. You don't have to tell God how often you fast. You don't have to tell God you give tithes of all. He already knows. He wasn't praying. He was boasting. And he was, he was making sure that the publican, who was also there, heard what he was saying. But listen to the prayer of the publican standing afar off. He would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote, him, uh, smote upon his breast, saying, God... Be merciful to me, a sinner. The publican is giving his resume of all of his religious activity and everything he does so well. The publican is over there in the corner saying, God, have mercy on me. I need you. I know what I am. I know what I've 
done. I know the mistakes. I know the failures of my life. And Jesus goes on to say, I'm not listening to the guy that's telling me about how good he is, but I'm over here with the guy that recognizes he needs me because I'm a physician and I'm going to go where the need is. That's the cry. Here's the promise. Psalm 147 and verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. If he's talking here about the broken in heart, then the wounds he's talking about are emotional wounds, internal wounds. He's not talking about a cut on the arm or the hand or a scrape on the knee. He's not talking about a physical external thing. And so he says he heals the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Can I tell you today that the great physician doesn't just simply give you a prescription to cope. Not trying to be offensive or unkind in any way to anyone, but the great physician doesn't just ask you what pharmacy do you use so I can send your prescription there and you can take one a day with a meal and it'll decrease or minimize the pain. The great physician looks at the need and says, I don't need a prescription. I'm just going to go to the heart because I've got the ability to take a broken heart that humanity has no solution for that humanity cannot deal with and I'm going to make it a brand new heart I respect and I appreciate every human effort to help humanity but all humanity can do at best is help somebody cope and that's why there are very notable organizations or programs that will tell you even if you make progress, what you were is what you always will be. You are just simply living the rest of your life recovering from what you were. But can I tell somebody in this place today that this book is not just about helping you recover from what you were and avoid that somehow how for the rest of your life but the apostle Paul said it like this if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away and all things have become new the apostle Paul also said that idolaters and fornicators and all kinds of other things that he gives a list of. He says those people cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Then according to man's philosophy, but just about every one of us are doomed today. Because man says, if that's what you were, that's what you are. You may not do what you did anymore. You may have it under control, but you still are that. And if that's the case, according to what Paul said, none of us have a chance at eternal life. But Paul says this, this is what you were. But you've been justified. You've been sanctified. You've been washed by the blood of Jesus. And so you are not what you used to be. Oh, I know, I know. I'm, hey, I'm the preacher and I don't know that I can process that with my brain. I'm the, I'm the guy that's supposed to be the educated one in all of this spiritual stuff. And I just don't know, Brother Isaac, that I get that. But what I do know is my head may not really get it. But there's something down in my spirit that says it may not make sense to my mind. But there's something inside of me that says that's got to be right. Hallelujah. I can calm down a little bit. Not really. <laughs> Jeremiah 30 and verse 17. I will restore health unto thee. You understand what he means when he says I will restore health? That means you had health but you lost it. 
may have been through circumstances out of your control that caused you to lose it, or it may have been decisions you made that caused you to lose your health. It doesn't qualify how you lost it. He just says, I will restore health unto you, and I will heal you of your wounds. I'd be very shocked if there's not an adult or even the teenagers that are still here. I'd be very surprised if there's not an adult that couldn't simply by looking at your hands find a scar. If not on your hands, it probably wouldn't take very long. I've, I've, got, I've got several different scars. You, you know the problem with the scars on my hands? I've got several very prominent scars that I can see, and the problem with every one of those scars is that, not everyone, but the problem with several of those scars is they are a direct result of stupid decisions. I, 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 got, I got a scar, I got a scar right there on the ring finger, right there on the ring finger, where I was sitting one morning just simply drinking a cup of coffee. And got the brilliant idea of trying to figure out how many fingers can you fit in the handle of the coffee cup. I got the index finger between my two middle fingers on my right hand and all of a sudden the whole handle of the coffee cup popped off and my finger ran across the jagged edge of the cup. We were living in Harwood at the time and so we decided to stop by the, the Edgewater Fire Department to see if I needed stitches. Do you know how I was in my early, mid-20s, mid I think? I, I wanted to go in there with a story. I wanted to go in there with a heroic story. I'm bleeding because I just rescued a life. I was sitting on my couch drinking my coffee and slit my finger open. I, I, I got one on the side of this thumb right before, this one was right before going to Youth Congress. Where I was trying to open a birthday gift that my parents had given one of my kids and I'm, 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 I'm trying to push the knife through the package to open it and it's, it goes through the package and about a quarter inch of the knife was inserted to the side of my thumb. And then I got this huge bandage that was like, I mean it looked like a, a, a mitten on one thumb. So I get to walk around for a week in front of all these strangers that I don't know, a bunch of people I do know and of course when you see somebody you do know, first question is, what'd you do? That, that, that's I do have a couple, I think, that came through, you know, more. I've got, I've got the shape. If you look close enough, I've got the shape of a Phillips head. And my middle finger. From trying to screw something and the screw gun slipped. I understand that you sitting here today with your emotional scars, it's probably not something frivolous. But I use that as the point to say that just as your natural wounds can heal and reach a point that while they may be a little embarrassing to tell about what happened, there is no longer the pain and the hurt from the wound because it is healed. He says, I'm not only going to restore your health, but I will also heal your wounds so you will have reminders of what you've been through, but you don't have to keep living with the pain of what you've been through. God help somebody in this place today if you've got pain he's a pain taker Hosea 14 and 4 excuse me Jeremiah 33 6 behold I will bring it health and cure I will cure them I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth 
Hosea 14 and 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. I preached to some folks today that at one point or other you've been a backslider. Listen to what the prophet said, what the Lord said through the prophet. I'm going to heal their backsliding and I will love them freely. I'm not going to love them conditionally because of what they've done. I'm going to love them freely without reservation. I got four kids and every one of those kids has made multiple mistakes in their lifetime. I deal with the mistakes they've made, but I continue to love them unconditionally and freely. And if I, as a natural father, can do that, how much more do you think the heavenly father has the ability to do that. Oh, I need somebody. Not that there's a battle or a fight, but I need somebody to pray with me just because just I believe God wants to do something in somebody today. Very momentous. Luke 9, 11, And the people, when they knew it, followed Him, and He received them, and spake unto them the kingdom of God, and He healed them that had need of healing. Now listen, 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 listen. I'm almost done. I'm only going to be a couple more minutes. The Pharisees say, what's up with your master? What's up with that guy you're following, hanging out with the sinners and the publicans? What's his deal? He ought to be, really what they were implying was, if he really is who he says he is, he ought to be hanging out with us. He ought to be associating with us because we're the ones that got it all together and we're the ones that are doing it all right. He ought to be, I mean, I think part of what they were saying was if he'd hang with us, we would give him some status. (laughs) But I'll tell you why he was hanging with the publicans and the sinners, the psalmist, hundreds and hundreds of years before had insight to something that Jesus was simply living out. Psalms 34 and verse 18. The Lord is nigh or near unto them that are of a broken heart. (laughs) I think God is really close to some folks here today. In fact, he's really close to some folks who think he's very far from you because you're broken. And yet, the psalmist said, God is near those that are of a broken heart and he saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. The Amplified says it this way, verse 18, The Lord is close to those who are of a broken heart and saves such as are crushed with sorrow for sin and are humbly and thoroughly penitent. That's who the Lord is close to. Many evils confront the consistently righteous, but the Lord delivers them, delivers Him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. The Message Bible says it this way, If your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. Oh, I love that. If your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. I like this next one too. If you're kicked in the gut, He'll help you catch your breath. I, I, I believe there's somebody this morning, you feel like you've been kicked in the gut. Life, life has given you a blow and you are gasping for breath. And the way the message Bible so eloquently says it is, if you're that way, He'll help you. He'll help you catch your breath. Disciples so often, I love this, disciples so often get in trouble. Still, God is there every time. He's your bodyguard shielding every bone, not even a finger 
gets broken. What, what, what I think that is saying, that last verse particularly is saying, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through some hard things. You're going to go through some painful things. But when, he, when it says that not even the King James, not even when he, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken, what he, what he is saying is when I get done with the healing process, there will not be some kind of permanent damage or, or lasting damage from what was done, but I am going to do a complete, thorough work of healing and restoration. Paul said we're troubled on every side. We're not perplexed. We are cast down, but we are not forsaken. The three Hebrew children stood facing a fiery furnace that their life was on the line, and they said, we will not bow because our God can deliver us. And even if our God doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to bow. I don't think they had any idea that they were going to get thrown into the fire and that God was going to meet them in the middle of the fire. And the Bible says they came out of the fire and they didn't even smell like smoke. I almost think God should have let them smell like smoke because they would have had a little bit of evidence. I mean, can you imagine going to somebody that wasn't there that day? Say, guess where I just came from? I was just in the middle of that fiery furnace. <laughs> let me prove it. You don't even smell like smoke. I, I, we now have a pellet stove up in our house. One of the reasons we have a pellet stove is I have had too many times of trying to build a fire in a fireplace where I have smoked up the house. So I'd much rather pour in some pellets and push a button and walk away. Because when you get that smell, that's kind of hard to get rid of. Sometimes you have to, in a fire, not everything may be totally destroyed, but because the damage of the smell of smoke, you've got to write it off and everything gets, everything gets thrown away. Oh, some, I understand what I'm saying right now from a natural perspective seems so impossible. I, I, I understand it. I got to be honest. I'm saying it and I say, how can that be? And I, I can't explain it intellectually. All I can do is tell you the Bible says that God has a way of not just healing you so that you can survive, but God has a way of bringing healing, but also bringing you to the point that you don't even smell like what you've been through. You don't have to live with the constant reminder of what I did and what I was and where I've been. However, you may still have some scars, but you can reach the point that when you see those scars, rather than the shame or the embarrassment of it, it now becomes a testimony. You want to remind me what I went through, devil? Let me show you the scars because my scars are now the mark of what I made it through. My my scars now show what I survived. Jesus. Thomas, you know what it was that Thomas said, I've got to see to believe? Thomas, I preached about Thomas, I think, last Sunday morning. When they told Thomas Jesus was alive, but Thomas wasn't there to see it, Thomas did not reply and say, if he'll open some more blind eyes, if he'll raise another dead person, I'll believe that he's the one. Thomas said, if I see the scars, I need to see the scars. I think what Thomas was saying was, those scars are not a sign of defeat. Those scars are not a sign of him being flawed. Those scars are the testimony of what he came through. See, here, here's, here's, I, I, I think I kind of intended or thought I'd make this point a lot earlier, but in closing, let me make it. 
I understand. I realize the, the naturally speaking, a physician needs people to be sick. That's their livelihood. I don't mean that in any unkind way. I don't mean that unkind. They, they, their job comes from helping people that are sick. They, they may be the, they may be the kindest, purest hearted human being there is, but they need people to be sick. They need somebody to try to help so that they can give a bill, hopefully to insurance. You go to the physician because you have a problem. If you don't have a problem, you don't go. You know what? I've met some really nice doctors, but i got to be honest. I'd rather just sit and chat with them at dinner somewhere than sitting in their office because i got a problem. we got a doctor, my parents, my brother, we've all been to him, orthopedic surgeon. You go there, you're probably there for... Most visits I've been there, I'm, 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 I don't mean what sitting and waiting. I mean you're usually with him about 40 minutes. Almost without fail, about 10 minutes is about your problem and what to do about it. And the other 30 is just some really great conversation. Great guy, really neat guy. Got some great background and stories. And I, Let's go get coffee and talk. I can't hear because I'm hurting. Do you know what? I know, naturally speaking, you're not probably going to really like this. But your heartache, your pain, your issues are an amazing blessing. Because you need something that the great physician has the opportunity to step into your life and deal with. If some of you weren't dealing with what you're dealing with in your life today, you wouldn't be sitting where you are right now. But I tell you, rather than it being a curse or rather than it being something negative, it's actually a blessing because it is the thing that has brought you to a place to have the great experience of knowing the great physician. It's not a wonderful life when you're able to live out your life with no problems and never recognize you have a great need of God. That's really a great curse. One of the greatest blessings of life is being able to have to deal with and go through situations that let you know, I need somebody. I need help. I need to cry out and acknowledge I can't do this by myself or I can't do this anymore. I don't have what it takes. I don't have the ability. Can I tell somebody this morning that maybe all you've really known about God is that He was God, but He said, I'm a physician and I'm going to meet you where your need is. And I know I've already said it. But he's not just simply going to write you a prescription for you to go off and get it and try to survive. But he is going to begin to heal, to fix, to mend. But then here's the really great thing. When he's done taking care of what you have need of, he's not going to say, see you. He's going to say, hey, now that you've known me as the great physician, I want you to know me as the friend that sticks closer than a brother. I want you to know me as the one that will never leave you or forsake you. I, I want you to know me as the one who is, as, the, as Solomon said, all together lovely. Would you stand? Would everyone that can... Would you stand? I, 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 if you, I, some of you, this is your first time, perhaps, but so this, this really may not, especially if it's your first time in a Pentecostal service, this may not mean a whole lot to you. But for those of you that that you, you've been here before, or maybe you've been in another Pentecostal church before, this is just your first time with us. If I could say it this way, I, what, what, what we're about to do is not intended to be what we kind of typically do at the end of a message. What 
what we are about to do right now is give anyone that was willing to acknowledge in some way, in some way in my life, I am that person that the Pharisees were criticizing Jesus for associating with. And I am willing to acknowledge today, I'm not the one that has it all together. I'm not the one that can stand there in the temple and talk about how often I fasted and how much I prayed and how well I'm, I'm not that person. I'm the other guy that was over in the corner acknowledging his failures and mistakes and flaws and need. I'm that guy, but can I tell you, it's that guy it's that person that God is being drawn to right now in this place I want to ask if you would to close your eyes for a moment if, I, if you're standing would you please just even if you're a guest I realize it may make you a little uncomfortable but I, I'm asking you to do that and the main reason I'm asking you to do that is just so that nobody will really feel like somebody's watching them right now Here's what I want to do. If you're in this place, again, whether you're a guest or you come here regularly, but you're willing to acknowledge, I'm in need of a physician, but not just any physician. I'm in need of the great physician that has all the ability and power to do what is necessary to meet my need. He doesn't just have, he's not just going to look at me and say, the best I can do is help you manage. Sometimes all the doctor can do is help you reach a point of pain management. We can't fix the problem. We can't make it right. We can just try to help the pain bearable. Can I tell you today, God is not into pain management. God, the great physician, is into healing and taking care of whatever the source of your problem is so that the pain can go away. So as heads are bowed and eyes are closed right now, I want to open the front of this sanctuary as we often call the altar area to those that are willing to acknowledge today, I need a physician. If you're a guest this morning, you don't have to come alone. If you've come with somebody that's a part of this church, I'm sure if you just tap them on the shoulder, they'd be more than willing to come with you right now. If you're a guest and you don't really know anybody this morning, I promise you by the time you get down to this front, we'll get somebody that'll come and stand by you and join with you to help you. That you won't have to be alone this morning. But I am telling you, somebody please hear me today. We're not just going through the motions of this right now but I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost that the great physician is in this sanctuary this morning and some people are going to leave change today in the name of Jesus come on I got people standing down here alone I don't want anybody standing alone down here You will heal. You will restore. You will draw near to those that are broken and wounded and hurting. Come on, I'm preaching to some people this morning that you, you, you've just kind of made up your mind. I'm just going to cope with the rest of my life. I'm just going to do the best I can to endure the rest of my life but I'm here to tell you today there is a great physician that his desire is not for you just to cope with the rest of your life but he is here to heal come on I, church I still see people standing alone down here come on church I still see people by themselves down here Great physician, great physician, great physician with hands like no other hands, with hands like no other hands, heal right now, restore right now, mend right now.
Come on, church. I need somebody to be sensitive, not just to those that are in the altar. There's some folks that are still standing where they are or sitting where they are that the Holy Ghost wants to touch them as well. Maybe they just don't have quite the courage or faith to come, but there's still something inside of them that's crying out right now. God, I need you. I'm broken. I'm messed up. I'm wounded. I've got issues. But if you're able and you're willing, then I want you to help me today. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Walk with me. You walk with me. Oh, you heal. You heal all. All my disease. So I trust you, Lord. So I trust you, Lord.
I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all I need. Oh, I believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. You're all I need. I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all I I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. Oh, yes, you are, Lord. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hands. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hands. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hands. I believe you're my healer. I believe you I believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. You're all I need, Jesus. You're 